Hello, my witchy friends. Welcome back to the fourth episode of Cat's Tea and Witchcraft. My name is Fauna, and I am your host. I would like to say thank you for all the support so far. Even though we are only four episodes into the podcast, I have been seeing great results in my analytics, and I am just ecstatic. I can't even believe that the results I'm already receiving, like, I didn't even think I would get more than a couple listens and even follows on social media for quite a few months and it has maybe been about a month but I guess I am offering you guys what you are looking for in this podcast and honestly I can't wait to see what the rest of the episodes in the future hold for us. So the topic that we are going to go over today is about your altar and tools. I know that probably some of you have already been doing your research on some of those things, but for those who are pretty early on in their journey, there are probably a lot of things that you're hearing and you just don't quite understand what some of the things are. So today I'm going to go over a variety of items and things you can put on your altar as well as the uses and the representation of some of these things as well. Before I get into the concept of the different items you can put on an altar, I'm going to go over what an altar is. You've probably heard of the term and you're like, well, isn't it just a table? Well, yeah, it is kind of just a table, but it's a little bit more than that. An altar is something that can either be a fixed feature in your home or a particular room, or it can be something that is only used periodically when you need to use it. Depending on your living situations, some people have a permanent altar in their bedroom or their living room or some sort of room that is dedicated to their practice or their craft. Some people might be their bedroom like me and other people if they have the extra space might put it in a nice little nook in their living or their sunroom or they have an office space that they have just dedicated to that part of their studies. And for those who don't have the space that's okay you can have a makeshift altar if you really don't have the room or you're kind of still in that broom closet. You can store your stuff in a chest under your bed or even in a shoebox but pull everything out as you need it and then place it on your altar. Your altar doesn't even really need to be a table. It could be the top of a box you're using as you need it to be. It could be a top of a stool or a nightstand or anything of that concept because everyone's situation is a little bit different. The only thing I would say is if you take your altar down on and off again as you're using it, feel free to cleanse your area every time you pull it out and to make sure you dedicate that time to meditating with your altar and claiming it as your altar. And I would say do the same thing. If you use maybe your kitchen or dining room table as needed, state that at that moment you are going to be using that table for your altar because otherwise it's just your dining room table. And some ways you can do that is you can maybe just meditate. You can take some sage or different incense that you like to use depending on your practice. Walk around and maybe mentally state that this is your altar. Or you can scream it as loud as you want if you really want to do that. Or even ring some bells and play some music. But whatever you feel like is just going to show the universe that this is a sacred space for you right now as an altar. That's all that really matters. And if you've never used an altar before, people use them for a variety of things. Personally, I use my altar for deity worship, spell workings, and just meditating in front of. You could use it for all of those things or additional things that maybe you do part of your craft. Some people do their divination at the table. Some people associate other parts of their room to do different parts of spells or rituals, but it is really all up to you. So I also have a list of a variety of items that you will either have around your altar, on your altar, or that you're going to be using when you're either casting spells or rituals. You personally might not use all these materials, but you might hear these terms a lot as well, depending on your practice. Some people don't like to use a lot of these tools, but some people use all of these tools and more depending on who they are. And I know not all listeners to this podcast might be Wiccans like I am, but learning about these tools might help you create your own path, even if you use them slightly differently. 
I would like to state early on, even though there are quite a few things that I'm going to be listing off, you do not need to go out and get these immediately. A lot of these, or at least probably half of them, you might have these things in your own household, or you might easily be able to access at Walmart, dollar stores, or Target even, depending on where you're at. I've even purchased a couple of these things at craft stores, but you can also make your own as well. And I will let you know which ones you can do that with. So here's a list of different items that you might have heard about or you might just be learning about today. Some items and witchy terms and tools that I am going to go over is the wand, athame, chalice or goblet, pentacle, staff, sword, cauldron, bowline, bell, basom or your broom, book of shadows, and altar. Some other common items that you might have in your own home or easily be able to get at the store are herbs, candles and candle holders, incense and incense holders, jars, crystals and stones, mortar and pestle, essential oils, statues and photos of deities. I wouldn't say that would be an easy one to access, but if you want to print out images of representations, that's actually pretty easy and you can just throw that into a picture frame on your wall. Robes, salt, and tablecloths. I know you might not have been expecting a long grocery list of items to get, but for those who are just trying to get a list of things they might want to look up, it's right there for you. So the first one I'm really going to go into detail is the wand. A wand is kind of what you think it is. It's a wooden stick that you use during spells or rituals. Unfortunately, you're not going to get any sparks or things flying out of the end of it, but it is kind of cool to have one anyway. Like I said, the wand is made out of wood and it is a representation of the air element. You use it to direct energies while you are in your circle or working with magic. You can either make your own wand with wood that you find outside or you can go to a store and purchase one. I wouldn't advise on purchasing maybe plastic wands, but honestly, if that's what you really like, it could work, but traditionally they are made out of wood. You can always add things to the wood, such as crystals or twine or anything that you find that represents you and gives it personality or if it makes it easier to hold. I know sometimes holding a wooden stick might not be the most comfortable things in your hand. So if you add maybe some leather or something on the bottom that makes it a little bit easier to hold, that's kind of an awesome idea. You do want to personalize your stuff to a point to when you look at it, you just really love it. And connect. You want to be able to connect with your tools. I personally bought my own, but I had been looking for one for a while, and I found it in a place I really didn't expect to. I was out of town on a small little vacation going down the East Coast, and I just happened to go into a witchy shop that I did not expect to find in a small southern town, and I... It just connected with me and I haven't found one since that I've ever wanted to replace it with. Doesn't mean I won't want to upgrade in the future, but for right now it is exactly what I need it to be. The next one is the Athame. The Athame is a representation of the fire element and it is a double-edged knife that is used to help cast circles. It is never actually used to cut anything physically except for the air itself. If you do not want to use an actual knife, either because you aren't comfortable using one, you can substitute it for something else that's maybe in a similar shape, such as a letter opener. But if you aren't comfortable with that at all, you can always use your hand as a substitute. And I would say use whichever hand you would consider your power hand. I know some people say their power hand is their dominant hand, but for me, it's actually the opposite. The third item that I'm going to go over is your chalice or goblet. If you thought it would be a representation of water, it is. A chalice is a cup that you use to drink from with either juice or alcohol to offer to the gods during rituals. And they don't need to be fancy. For the first few years that I was practicing, I just used a little glass cup that looked like a skull. It kind of looked really cool and I hadn't found anything else that I had really liked 
until about this year. Now I actually have two different chalices for different types of rituals. I found a solid glass one that almost looks like a martini glass and it's just solid clear glass at the stem and then I found one that's a little more fancy. I got it from a witchy kind of shop and it looks like it has a tree on it and I just think it's the cutest thing. I know some people make their own chalices or when they go to Renaissance Fair or they find vendors that make pottery, that's where they get their chalice from. The next thing is the pentacle. The pentacle is a five-pointed star and each corner represents earth, air, water, fire, and spirit. The pentacle is a representation of the earth element. You can either make it or you can purchase one that's made out of clay, wood, or metal. I kind of made mine. I found a clay flat piece of thing, whatever it is, from Michael's and then I painted the pentacle on top of it and then I sealed it with a spray and added glitter onto the top of it. I chose to make it black and purple just because I didn't want it one solid color and I put it in the middle of my altar. And this next one is one of my favorites. It's the cauldron and it is also a representation of water. You typically see them as a cast iron bowl that has small little legs, a handle, and a cover on it. Your cauldron doesn't need to be large because sometimes you're going to need to use them and walk around with it if you are using it to burn incense or little notes. Mine I would say is no larger than three inches across total. And these are one of the things, the larger they get, the pricier they get. So I would say stick with a small one and honestly spend no more than 40, 60 bucks maximum because those suckers are heavy when they get large. I would not advise using these for potions or anything liquid that you put put into it because if it is real cast iron, it will rust. And unless you really want to oil that thing up every time you use it like a cast iron skill in the kitchen, I would just use it with dry materials. You do not need the cauldron to cast spells or any sort of jars. You can use regular bowls while you're doing your spell. You don't need to look like you're in Hocus Pocus. The next small one here is the bell. You can use a bell to clean up energies or that you can use them to call attention during your rituals. I'm not sure if any of you guys have gone to a yoga class where they use bells or singing bowls at the ends and maybe the beginning of classes. I've only really heard them use them at the end of it. They kind of help just get you into a really nice mindset. Another really cool one is the basom or your broom. The brooms are not used to sweep actual literal dirt in your area. They are used to cleanse your area of negative energies to help set up for your circle around your altar during a ritual. Sometimes you can also find them being put over doors for protection or people jumping over them during weddings. And the last term that I'm actually going to go over today in detail is the Book of Shadows. The Book of Shadows is a notebook used to write down your magical notes, workings, and experiences. Generally handwritten, but you can also use them, type them up, and print them into a notebook, or you can keep them on your computer. We're in modern times, might as well have modern solutions. So for this episode, those are all the terms that I am going to go over. If you would like some more information on some of these items, you can feel free to message me on my social media for the podcast. On Instagram, it is Cats Tea and Witchcraft. On Twitter, it's Cats Tea and Witch. But you can also find in the podcast description, there is an email at Cats Tea and Witchcraft Podcast at gmail.com. If you don't want to send me a message, that's okay. In my last episode, I did go over some resources that you guys can utilize to do some additional research. I know in the future, I'm going to have separate episodes on herbs, candle magic, the use of crystals and stones, and essential oils as well. So stay tuned for those future episodes. Again, I would like to say thank you for those who so far have been supporting the podcast. And if you are new, Welcome, and I will see you guys again next week. Blessed be.